We are the, uh, or at least we're trying. <laughs> Sullivan's attempt at hitting something. Uh, <laughs> we're trying to be the official Magnus Ar Archives podcast. Let's talk about the Magnus Archives. Yeah, sure. So, uh, That's an evergreen topic one... that will never, ever stop being relevant. <laughs> We've got until March. It's fine. Uh, you deserve it. Which... Uh, so one thing that we uh, have talked about independently by, is, by the time the uh, supercut of this comes out which is like the version that I actually stand by and think is worth watching by the time that version comes out the Magnus Archives will already have been oh, have, have ended and its fan community entered into a rapid withering yep <laughs> which makes me feel bad for them because you know those guys did great work and now they're going to lose everything because their series is coming to an end but hey, it was a fun ride while it lasted, so, you know, hopefully that's enough for him. Anyways, though. One thing uh, Cam and I have talked about is, you know, you have the avatars, and, like, it's like you, uh, you become an avatar, like, one of the most interesting ways is that you fall to, like, a monomania. Like, you get obsessed with this thing that each entity uh, represents. Uh, with the avatars we meet, we don't always really get that sense, like... Jane Prentice didn't really have any monomania with bugs. She just got infected by a disease. That yes. disease gave her a monomania, but, like, she didn't actually have that initially. She just said... Yeah, she wasn't obsessed with... Hive. Yeah, she wasn't obsessed with disease or with bugs or uh, with even, like, you know, the sense of love that the bugs ultimately brought her. That wasn't an obsession that she had that led her to the corruption. Like, she got mind-fucked. That's the beginning and the end of it. Uh, and, like, they hint at it sometimes, uh, but a lot of them, like, like, uh, Jude Perry, like, she was just always a, she always liked hurting people. She doesn't really grow and develop into somebody who likes hurting people. Uh, yeah, she was always, uh, sort of a monster, and now she has superpowers. Uh, Michael Crew made an Alliance of Convenience with the vast in order to escape the spiral. I think I got the right Michael on that one. I may have gotten them backwards. There's so many of them. So, I pulled up a list. Uh, yeah, let's go ahead and just go through them alphabetically. I feel like we've got a pretty good pitch for why someone would fall to each of these entities. I don't know if we have all of them, but, you know, if we don't have one, we can figure it out on camera. Yeah. So the first is the buried. Uh... Based on the buried avatars one that we get, like, the buried is like, you'll get to rest. You're tired, and you're gonna get, it's like, the buried will let you rest. Yeah, the buried, the buried ultimately does not want you to move, and if you're very tired, you might be okay with that. I also see the buried making you feel safe and enclosed, cut off from anything that can hurt you. And there is, like, as part of this, we kind of have to move away from the entities as, like, fear entities, which is frankly not a good idea anyway. Like, I can see how that idea happened with, you know, oh, we're doing a horror show and our, you know, it's going to revolve around these fear entities that are each based on a different human fear. This has a number of problems. Firstly... Very few things exclusively cause terror, so the entities inevitably end up entangled with lots of other emotions, like a feeling of safety, for example. And emotions is... are very multifaceted, like fear, they all fade into each other. It, fear fades into joy via excitement. Like, it's what they right. get into with, uh, with uh, Inside Out when they start getting those um, the memories that have multiple emotions attached to them. Like, we, we, the, the five uh, emotion model, like, there's empirical evidence, but it's ultimately a human construction of understand how we understand our emotions. It's a social construction. That's also, one that's helpful for talking about emotions, but it's not like they all fade the, into each other. Isn't the model with actual empirical evidence behind it a six emotion model? And then inside out, cut that's surprise, right. because they basically they did, couldn't make a distinct character for surprise separate from fear? That. I don't know off the top of my head, but I entirely believe that. 
I believe I read that somewhere, but, you know, that's a thing that I think I saw on the internet once, so, you know, that <laughs> that's the level of uh, certainty that I'm operating with. Emotions are complicated. They are multifaceted. So trying to reduce it just down to fear is uh, yeah. run into issues. I love the Magnus Entities. I like. I think every single one... I think they're a great idea in general, and I think every single one of them is compelling. But... Uh, or at least can be made to be compelling. I do think in the actual uh, Magnus Archives, there's a couple of them. Probably not even the majority, but there's a couple of them that they kind of missed the mark on. But overall, I think yeah. it's... you know, it, I think most of them are really good. I think all of them have a lot of potential, even if they didn't quite get executed properly. And most of them did get executed really well. Um, certainly all the ones that are a major focus... Except the hunt, we'll get there. Uh, but all the other ones that we spend a lot of time with are really good. Like with the buried, you could see somebody falling to the buried because they just want to wall them. Like you'd see like a survivalist, somebody with a compound. You just like they want to get as safe as possible. They know bad things are going to happen, and they need the only thing that can protect them is if they dig a hole and they just fortify it and just make it as small and as closed off as possible. You'd see that as the person falling to the buried. Uh, so either like the safety or with like Ezekiah, Ezekiah Wakely was the desire to rest, I think is how you fall to the buried. Uh, the corruption gets into something we just talked about with the, the undercurrents of other emotions that are in all these entities, because the corruption is love. Like the corruption will accept you no matter how much you let, let yourself deteriorate. You they fall apart, you give up. You stop uh, taking showers. You stop washing your clothes. You ignore the fact that you're being eaten alive by worms. Uh, corruption loves you regardless. You don't have to worry about anything anymore. You don't have to care. You can just turn into a uh, worm that walks. Yeah, and, and corruption I mean, still loves you. Look, it's it's 2020. You know, we've all had at least one weekend where we just, you know, didn't take any showers, didn't brush our teeth, got turned into a flesh hive. <laughs> and like, but yeah. Cameo but... was talked about is the corruption is kind of like, uh, oh gosh, I don't know the... Uh, uh... Nurgle, yes. Nurgle. Um, one thing that I like about the Magnus Entities is that they remind me a lot of the better interpretations of, you know, you, it's Warhammer 40k, it's Warhammer uh, in general, so obviously there are some versions of this that are just extremely dumb um some of them even have the presence of mind to be like satirical and comedic about how dumb they are some of them don't it's warhammer but uh a really good interpretation of the chaos gods though has them as these sort of double-edged creatures uh who can even potentially be forces for good in a saner galaxy but because the Warhammer 40k galaxy has gone completely insane and because the warhammer chaos gods are you know, fueled by the human subconscious, it means that the Chaos Gods are the Saturday morning cartoon supervillains. But, like, you know, that's the state they're in, but it's not all there is to them. They are more complex than that. The Magnus Entities remind me of that a lot, which, again, it, you know, kind of bugs me that they are the supposed to be these pure fear entities because they sustain more complexity than that, and they're better when they're more complex than that. And, yeah, uh, the Corruption is basically Nurgle when Nurgle is done well. Which is, Papa Nurgle always loves you. Uh, you know, no matter how uh, disgusting and disease-ridden you become, Papa Nurgle always loves you, and you know he wants you. He wants to spread his love to you in the form of terrible plagues, but you will not suffer from them because Papa Nurgle is also like weirdly Buddhist. <laughs> in that, you know, he wants to rid you of your desire to. Uh, be any better and therefore make you perfectly content with all things including the space cancer that's devouring your face <laughs> uh, next is the dark oh and so... as we're getting into one that doesn't have a direct 40k analog here's another thing that I like about the Magnus Entities uh, oh, uh, as opposed to the Chaos Gods but which I think the Magnus Entities could have and should have done better which is that the Chaos Gods, there's four of them. That's not very many. The Magnus Entities, there's 14 of them. That's a nice big clutch. But I do think it would still would have been better to leave them open-ended. Like, 
here's the 14 that we know about and are interacting with. Sure, it's good to have that list. But don't have it be the 14 that definitely exist. Go ahead and just have it be the 14 that Smirk knows about and that we're currently dealing with. They did have a thing with the, yeah. uh, the extinction, but that was specifically a new entity that was birthed recently. I think it would have been better off if they said, you know, if they left it more ambiguous, like, there could be other entities out there, we don't really know, but if they are, they haven't been our problem so far, and we hope it stays that way. Leave room well, for expansion. I kind of like the idea that, because uh, there's this one episode that in, like, season three where it's a guy who has turned himself into a computer program, and the fandom was never able to figure out what entity it was associated with. And they uh, eventually went that it was supposed to be uh, the spiral. And that kind of made me think, I kind of like the idea that the spiral might not even be an actual entity, that it's sort of like this catch-all that like Smirk used for stuff he could not figure out. Like, if you talked to uh, the distortion and brought up the spiral, it would not have any about because the spiral is the sort of socially constructed catch-all that was used for all these ones that don't actually fit together. Right, for basically every entity that Smirk couldn't nail down. Yeah. I do like that uh, interpretation. There's another interpretation. I don't want to get into it just yet, but there's an alternative interpretation for the end that I really like. We'll be there in just a bit. Which, uh... Yeah, for the dark. Yeah, the dark. Uh, you were the one who came up with the interpretation of this that I really liked, so why yeah, don't you so take the floor on that? Two of the prominent uh, avatars of the Dark are uh, scientists. Uh, one's an astrophysicist and one is an astronomer. Uh, and it never actually, like... And the late, uh, one of the later, you run into an avatar who is a child. And they never actually bring explicitly make this conclusion. But I, when I realized that, I started sort of turning it around in my head. And I realized that, like, oh, the appeal of the Dark is you get to undo disenchantment you're a scientist and you've studied the world and you figured out exactly how it works and it no longer holds any sense of wonder for you the world's been disenchanted the there's nothing on the moon but dust there's nothing on mars there's no alien civilizations we'll probably never find any alien civilizations there's just uh dead planets and uh lifeless stars uh there's no god there's no afterlife there's no ghosts, there's no fairies, because you drove away the dark with the light of science. And now you want to undo that. And so you can undo yeah. that by bringing the darkness back into the world. You get to fill, you get to have blank spaces on the map. And even if they are filled up with monsters, well, that's better than there not being any blank spaces at all. You want to have stuff you don't know about. You want that sense of wonder that uh, people talk about in science fiction. This, because uh, you, you've completely figured it out, and you want that sense of wonder back. You lost that that sort of the feeling of possibility you have when you're a child, which is what made it really interesting that the you got a child avatar. Like, he, the child avatar, you could say it's like, well, he falls to the dark because he has that sense of wonder and he wants it, he has it so deeply that the fact that it's bringing with it all these monsters seems to him to be really, really cool. <laughs> it's a very childlike right. way of being enchanted, but like, you know, you're a 13-year-old boy and oh, there's cool monsters I can get to interact with. That makes sense. So, Let's if you fall, the fall to the dark is the desire to re-enchant the world. And I do want to say, like, I think the idea that scientists think they have the world completely figured out is kind of misleading. But it's definitely true that all the answers they find are kind of boring. Like, definitely, there's a lot we don't know about space. And I expect the average astrophysicist is pretty excited about finding out more. But we're never going to find an alien civilization on Mars, right? Or, I mean, okay, I don't know for sure, but... Uh, you know, the, 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 it seems pretty conclusive at this point that we're never going to find... Well, uh, on Mars, I'm pretty sure. That we're never going to find a planet like what we thought Mars would be, right? There's never going to be a civilization full of alien spacemen out there. And so, you know, I... I don't want to lay on too thick the idea that scientists have the world entirely figured out, because no, they don't. Uh, and, you know, that's, like... Not... Like, like, like scientists themselves... Not only admit to that, but are motivated by that. They want to go out and find answers. But it makes sense to me as a motivation for the dark that, like, this, the answers that scientists find are not very satisfying. The world was not set up to be exciting or climactic to uh, humans. 
Well, in, dis in disenchantment and sort of this sense of unhappiness with disenchantment can happen to people who aren't scientists and just feel like modernity has not lived up to its promises. Like, that's what you get out of, like, uh, the dialectic of enlightenment by Adorno and uh, the, like, that, it, that we had this disenchantment and it ended up being a system of domination. It didn't live up to its promises. It's like you grow up, you're supposed to grow up and like you get disenchanted, but you also get the agency and the sense of freedom, but you feel like, you can have that sense of feeling like, yeah, I grow, grew up in the world disenchanted and it's just, it's been a net loss. That can happen to anybody. Right. Uh, so that would be, yeah, just I think that's the dark pitch. Yeah, I do just want because there are there are scientists who get angry at being stereotyped as thinking they know everything or whatever. Yeah. And so, like, you know, I, I do want to be clear that's not the idea behind the dark. Is not that scientists literally know everything, but like, you know, you would be rather shocked if you discovered in one of the unexplored corners of science to discover fairies living there. <laughs> like, there are some, like, you know. Scientists do not know everything, but there are definitely possibilities that have been taken off the table. And, you know, the possibility space has been constrained, and it's definitely true that, you know, there is a time in your life when it seems like magic could be real. And, yeah, it, it, it uh, makes sense. No mistakes. I could see someone <laughs> falling to the dark because they want that back. Next is uh, the desolation, which I think is a pretty obvious one. That's like you can get back at the people who've hurt you. Yeah, you desolation needs to be the way they made you suffer. Which Jude Perry just seems to enjoy hurting people and seem like she has like been hurt and has an axe to grind and wants revenge. Uh, none of the cult of the lightless flame seems like they have that as a motivation. Yeah, and it seems uh, like they seems never like did. Like awful. Jude Perry takes us through her entire backstory. And it seems like she always just liked hurting people for its own sake, and not even in a sexy way. Uh, but yeah, like you know, it just seemed like she was always just a sociopath who liked hurting people, like destroying lives. Uh, and I like the idea much better that yeah, you want revenge on specific people, and then your desire to destroy the people who have harmed you sort of spirals outward and outward. And becomes more all-consuming, and you eventually do set into this monomania, where you know you destroy things because they are there, you hurt people because uh, they can up. suffer. Pull up the map for a second. All right, I think uh, that path this up and towards the right might take you there. This here. Uh, sort of north, and then uh, immediately west. West. Or east? East, I'm sorry. Okay. North and east. Yeah, so the, the Desolation had a really obvious way to go. Next the Desolation the end, is definitely is the first one where I feel like they absolutely fell down on this one. Um, like, the corruption uh, might not quite have stuck the landing, but Jane Prentice was still really compelling. But with, uh, what's her name even? Jude something? Jude Perry? Jude Perry. Yeah, like, she is, I called her... In, when I was talking to Requiem when I first heard the episode, I called her generic arsonist villain, and that's really what she came off as. It was just... Yeah. Next that's the first one of the entities that, yeah, I feel like they didn't do well, which is an exception. I think it's one of only two or three that they didn't really do well. Next is the end. Okay. And the thing I want to lead with with the end is my... Uh, head cannon for them that I'm so sad got uh, sort of firmly decanonized by the end of season four, the way their metaphysics turned out to work. Which is, I like the idea that the end has already won and we are living in their universe. Like, the reason why everything inevitably decays and, you know, why entropy always wins in the end, it's because someone at some point completed a ritual for the end which retroactively made the universe into something that works on entropy. Something where the end is inevitable. Actually, I really like this idea, and it made me sad that uh, Season 4 firmly established that rituals are actually impossible to get right, unless you do them in a very specific way that causes the world to go utterly berserk. 
Not everyone reads the subtitles, so here's an audio warning that we're about to get into a discussion of suicide. If you're not in the headspace for that, there's a timestamp on the screen to skip to. So if you don't want to hear the subject discussed, now's the time to tap out of your video game or fish your phone out of your jogging pants or whatever. Statement resumes in three, two, one. The thing is, like, with the end, I don't know what the pitch is, because if you get, if you have that monomania with death, there's a way to embrace it, like, and this is a little dark to even bring up, like, this might be, like, this is content warning material. Yeah, uh, I can actually go ahead and stick a content warning in front of this, uh, with a little timestamp for when we're done with it, but, yeah, the obvious thing to do with the end, if you embrace the end, then that's exactly what it sounds like. You'll kill yourself. Yeah. And, like, because, like, the couple of avatars we meet don't really even seem like avatars. They just seem like victims. Like, Oliver is the one who's always afraid because uh, he can see other people's deaths. Tova is a villain, and people talk about this, but she's also, she's the one who is constantly being made afraid of death. She hasn't embraced it or have a, have a even a, real like the monomania what the way that other people the other avatars do she's just constantly afraid of dying there's the one guy who like asphyxiates people in his dreams like again he fears dying but he just doesn't have a monomania with death of like embracing death because then he would want to die and it's you know because we live in a universe uh defined by entropy is you know inevitable uh, inevitable in north North. Generally, like, unless under very contrived circumstances, not especially hard to do. Pull up the map. What the Can you make an epic pose? I, I think that corner that you just pointed out up. Yeah, that one some, that goes okay. sort of to the right. I think that's going to take you there. You'll have to play these centipedes first, but these corridors are so narrow. But like, because I don't know what, because what does a somebody who has a monomania with a death look like? Like, I don't know that you can, like, you know, in our world, but, like, it's what we mentioned, like. Yeah, like, the a, end has already won, and it's not clear what someone obsessed with death would even do. Like, like their victory yeah, think, like, is already assured. Like, I think you could really have the, you could justify saying the end does not take avatars because the end does not need avatars, the end has won. I mean, you probably wouldn't actually want to do this, like, in, like, uh, you know, uh, I don't know what the equivalent for on page or on screen is for uh, a radio show, but uh, on air, I guess. Like, you don't want to have an actual story about how someone falls to the end and then just kills themselves. That's like some pretty heavy shit that you probably don't want to get into. But as a lore thing, I would be okay with the idea that, yeah, the end takes avatars and then just immediately kills them. Like, that is how you become an. Avatar of the end. Your time is over. Uh, so at this next one, I don't think we actually ever came up with it. Because uh, it's kind of, it was, because you didn't know about it at the time because it was not revealed yet. Uh, the extinction. Yeah, and this is a questionably real one. It's not clear if this was a real threat that was used as part of a gambit to try and corrupt Martin, or if it was totally fabricated to try and corrupt Martin. Uh, so far as I heard uh, from the show as I listened to it, and I, I do not listen extremely carefully to this show, right? I'm not a wiki updater type who is making sure to get all the lore straight, so maybe I just missed something. But as far as I heard from the show, uh, it was never really settled one way or another whether or not this is a real thing. It is a cool idea, though. Yeah, and they mentioned like that it has that if it is real, it has not taken avatars. But what would an avatar of the extinction like? Is that is there a pitch that like what gets you? Can we think of what the it draws you into the extinction? Like, is it? Yes, uh, I have an idea. The I idea is, uh, you are drawn into the extinction by transhumanism. You want to become more than human, and I mean obviously it has to be. In order to be like a avatar entity grade, it has to be like, very much more than human, like clearly inhuman, not just. An enhanced human, right? Which is... That's a... Like... Most people want to be transhuman, quote-unquote, in the sense of 
being able to do like computer speed calculations in their brain if it's all just superpowers but you're otherwise basically a regular human then sure but like that corridor you just mm-hmm. sort of pass it it's yeah. kind of hard to see and i think that's why it took me so long when i was playing Yeesh, this is tucked into a corner isn't it Come at me. yeah but yeah the I, I do think the idea of you know you want to become you want to transcend your limitations and you don't care how much humanity you lose in the process. I don't know. Yeah, I think, that. like, I can see that, or, like, it's sort of similar as, like, the world is shit, and we need to end it and get something new. Yeah. Uh, I kind of, like, I like, because people suggested this before they said it was the spiral. I kind of like the idea of that computer one being some sort of manifestation of the extinction where the guy has fed himself to a computer somehow. Right. Like, I could definitely see that as being a uh, an extinction of, you know, he is trying to become an immortal computer entity, and, you know, he is totally willing to leave behind all, you know, at the very least, all mortal pleasures, all pleasures of the body, in order to achieve that, which I feel like is the bare minimum you can get bef- to, in order to be giving up your humanity in some way. Is that, you know, so, no food or drink yeah. or sex or whatever? Like, I think the extinction is a little hard to talk about because regardless of whether it is real, uh, it has the least episodes. Like, even if it's real, it's got, like, five episodes. Yeah, I, which does sort of put us in a situation of, like, we're just making shit up because it's very poorly fleshed out. You know, its ultimate narrative purpose uh, was just to be a red herring to be a threat that uh, an avatar of the lonely could use to try and invent another avatar of the lonely. Invent is exactly what that word means. <laughs> and I even botched up my lampshading of the botching. <laughs> I'm not an open off the cuff speaker, guys. Uh, next would be the eye. I feel like... I mean, this one's pretty obvious. You just want to know stuff, and you can get obsessed with it. You also have uh, what uh, what uh, John went through with the uh, paranoia. Yeah, in Season 2, I think Season 2 was a really good example of someone falling to the eye, and then it's really weird that during Season 3, he pretty much unfalls to the eye and then falls to the eye anyway. Yeah, that the kind of... The climax of Season 3 needed to happen at the end of Season 2. I'm okay with John backpedaling it on it a bit after he's already fallen and become somehow fundamentally altered. That's still a little bit annoying because I do like the idea of avatars being monomaniacal. But for the sake of having a character who isn't just a constant dying paranoiac, I'd allow it. Ultimately, though, I think the best way to do it would have been to have had John's fall into total paranoia happen at the end, at, like, season four. You know? Like, that's... His descent into paranoia is his final uh, loss of sanity as he becomes the Magnus Archives. Uh, Next is the Flesh, which is another one that you've talked about that kind of has its parallel in Warhammer 40k with uh, Flesh. Yes, the Flesh is best when it is, and again, a better interpretation of Slanesh. Slanesh, as you know... The god of sex and cake is one of the uh, chaos gods where you know it's it's easiest to do them in a way that's kind of juvenile and, and uninteresting. But uh, there is a version of Slanesh which is basically settle for nothing less than the absolute most extreme and exquisite experience, um, which you know includes body modification. You're not a melee fighter. Oops. Uh, but yeah, it includes extreme body modification. Um, and you know, more and more extreme body modification, right? Like, the first thing, a uh, a servant of the flesh or, you know, someone who has fallen to Slanesh, whichever way you want to talk about it, because again, I do think they're basically the same pitch. The first thing they're going to do is, of course, make themselves impossibly beautiful according to conventional beauty standards for whatever culture they live in. Yeah. But then that's not enough because it's never enough. And so they're going to start going more and more extreme into it. At some point, they will not even be recognizably human anymore. Like, you get to the point where, like, 
well, like I made a perfect human body, but there's all sorts of flaws of the human body. Like the fact that you breathe and eat through the same tube is kind of a mistake and I can fix that. And you know, our spines are poorly designed. I can fix that. Uh, eventually you're an inhuman flesh monster. <laughs> yeah. Like the, the, the episode about the flesh that really made me feel them was the one where the gym rat starts using steroids to try and get as much performance out of himself as possible and discovers that the, you know, the gym that he's joined, which sort of looks the other way about this sort of thing, is some kind of flesh cult. And they're trying to, you know, with the steroids, sort of ease him into the idea of uh, doing absolutely anything to achieve his own vision of a perfect body. And so, you know, he sees this weird leg monster that is ludicrously specialized into gymnastics and is, like, not even recognizably human anymore because of it. And yeah, and it's supposed to be a fear of, like, factory farming. This is dumb. Like, the idea of entities being created out of animal fears is slightly intriguing, but it also means you really need to accept the fact that those are animal fears and not human fears and they will never be particularly compelling to humans. Like, if it's a fear that we don't have, then we are not going to be affected by it. They try to justify it by saying, oh, well, when it interacts with humans, it picks up some weird neuroses from us, but I find that an unsatisfying answer. And it gets again into the thing where having the magnet entities be fear specifically is a waste of perfectly good potential. I like the idea that the flesh is based strongly in desire, not fear. Like, obviously, it gets a lot of body horror stuff. Like, you know, there's someone out there who's got, like, seven eyes. He looks gross as hell. <laughs> but, like, I don't know. He really wanted to be able to see things or something. Especially because, I mean, you know, right. the, the flesh is one... Uh, the extinction is actually kind of the same way, depending on your interpretation... You can make an argument that, like, uh, and uh, for most of these you can, for all of them you should be able to even, that if the flesh won, then, you know, once you got over your knee-jerk knee reaction to change, everything would ultimately be better. Like, yeah, we would look scary, but then we'd get used to it, and we'd all have bodies that are insanely well adapted to whatever it is we want to do. Next is uh, The Hunt. So I imagine you have some thoughts. Yes, uh, The Hunt is the obviously best entity. And the sad thing is, I should be joking, but I don't think I really am. <laughs> so in the Magnus Archives, there's a problem where The Hunt focuses relentlessly on hunters, never on being hunted. And this makes The Hunt come across as the good guy entity. You know, this is the entity that produces Buffy the Vampire Slayer, basically. Uh, the Daisy, I think her name is, the main hunt. Daisy, yeah. Yes. The primary hunt uh, avatar we see, she talks a good game about being, you know, really ruthless and evil. And, uh, you know, the authors have informed us that she is supposed to be an example of, uh, you know, all cops are bastards. What's that? But they kind of forget to actually do that, ever. Like, they make vague references where it's like, uh, you know, uh, she actually has lines where, you know, she'll talk about, oh, do you want to know the kinds of things I've done? And then the other characters are like, no, no, that's fine. Please, continue <laughs> telling. Show us nothing. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, The Hunt has uh, an issue where it is... It comes across as a cannibal entity that seems to feed entirely off of other entities. And that's just not... <laughs> yeah, which, you know, which, which makes I it the good guy one, entity. I only think of one episode, one hunt episode that is about being hunted more than el is about being a hunter of some kind. Like the one very early on where he, the guy goes to West Virginia and uh, turns out to be a special ops agent. Yeah. Which, I mean, especially because, like, he almost literally has a line where he's like, oh, did I forget to mention I was in the SAS? 
So anyway, yeah, this wasn't even a problem for me. I just killed the thing. Oh. I guess that worked out then. I'm not sure how to get so back like, up that slope. I guess the hunt is like the thrill of the chase. Like you just get addicted to that. Yeah, I would say the hunt is more than anything else. It is the desire to um, acquire or defeat something. Sort of like the desire for accomplishment. Um, but, you know, especially, you know, the desire to sort of test yourself against the most dangerous game. Hippos. <laughs> Not man. Have you seen man? Nah, it's kind of pathetic. Let's be honest. <laughs> So I guess next uh, is the lonely, uh, you know, and like the hunt, that lonely is guys. Uh, <laughs> not really anything to say about that. Look, look. So like other people suck. Like if you think about like where your pain has come from, almost certainly most of it has come from other people, and you're dependent on other people. And like, what if you didn't actually need that? Like, what if you could? be completely provided for without depending on anybody else and you could just be completely isolated and not have to deal with the pain that comes from interacting with other people. Wouldn't that be nice? So, like, you know, this is clearly, like, the pitch somebody good is making. Uh, and, like, that's why uh, I am in the middle of trying to complete the silence and once we are all consumed by the lonely, the world will be much better. Oh, by the way, uh, pitch for a Magnus Archives video game where uh, you play as a hunt avatar and in order to complete your own Magnus Archive style ritual like you know, as they established in season 4 in order to successfully complete a ritual you have to summon every entity at once you can't do them one at a time because alas it turns out that the end has not already won and we are not just living in their universe but so long as that's canon then uh, yeah I want a Magnus Archives video game where you play as a hunt avatar and you have to hunt down an avatar or monster of each of the other 13 entities with, like, some kind of special, you know, hunting... You have, you have to finish them off with some kind of special uh, hunt entity artifact. And uh, if you do this to all of them, then you will... Uh, then, like the Magnus Archives, you will have united them all into one being and spread the Everhunt across the world. And, and the last the last one is obviously your friend who is the avatar of the lonely killed to uh, hurt uh, because ultimately it was about you're not an avatar of the desolation you don't want to destroy someone you just want to hunt them yeah the important thing is that you run for your life and I caught you anyway <laughs> but then you realize it was all a trick and I throw you into the lonely <laughs> no like the lonely pitch is you know other people suck like you had to deal with other people and like they cause they cause you pain and you can just this is a way to get out of having to deal with the pain of interacting with other people you just slowly isolate yourself you get more and more isolated and you're just okay with it you get to the point where you just want it you want to be alone uh next is the slaughter Uh, so there's there's sort of a spectrum of personableness, of personalness, of the three violent uh, entities, the hunt, the slaughter, and the desolation, which is that the desolation is very personal. It's all about specifically destroying someone's life and hurting them as much as possible in the ways that only they can be hurt because of the things only they care about. Uh, the hunt is less personal. Um, but it is still about destroying a specific person, even if more in a, uh, you know, you are hard to catch or difficult to fight or in some other ways, you know, you would be a challenge to kill and therefore I will kill you just to test my own limits. I am the evil Goku. This was Goku Black's origin story all along. Uh, the desolation is the least personable where it doesn't care about you at all. Or the slaughter, sorry, yeah. It doesn't really care about you at all. It's just firing artillery shells at that village over there because orders from high command said to fire artillery shells at that village over there. 
and they're not super concerned about the fact that people are dying along the way. This is someone who has, like, a quota of murders, and they're just going to sweep those murders up as fast as possible. Or at least this is, I should say, how I interpret the slaughter as different from the hunt or the desolation. I think the slaughter's fit is, like, just sort of that visceral satisfaction of violence divorced from anything else. Like, it's the right. fun you get out of playing a shooter video game, and you can just have that infinitely. Like, it's Valhalla, essentially. Uh, you get you you want to indulge in violence, not, not for any, like, specific reason, but just because you just kind of enjoy violence. Like, there are people who like getting in fights. Uh, that's the thing. Yeah. Like, it's not... Like, you know, and, I mean, you know, people who do MMA for fun... Like, uh, it's and, not because and, they have a vendetta against their opponent, it's because they like uh, having to get a fight. Or right. Like, like paying a blind video game or watching a violent movie, movie. It's not about anything specific. It's just like that visual enjoyment of violence. Yeah, and I mean, you know, MMA can get yourself into the sort of the testing your limits against the foe kind of a thing. But I think, I mean, you know, not, not to say that that's not a necessarily a good example, but the purest example, I think, is a violent video game. Those can be quite easy sometimes and still perfectly enjoyable, right? Like, whether or not a violent video game is, is viscerally enjoyable has almost nothing to do with whether or not it's challenging. Like, you know what? Dark Souls? Challenging as hell? <laughs> not very visceral at all. Like, it's not terrible, but... It doesn't have that visceral satisfaction, that Doom 2016 satisfaction of tearing some guy's head off with a chainsaw. Right. Uh, this next one is a tough one. Uh, I don't know. I, I've never been able to figure out the answer because uh, it's uh, the spiral. I think part of the thing with the spiral is uh, we don't really uh, seem to ever get somebody who is an avatar who is definitely an avatar. Yeah, we, we have get, these uh, weird half avatars. Like Michael and Helen don't seem like an avatar. They seem like Gertrude damaged a spiral entity by solving it and put like burned an imprint of a human onto this fundamentally inhuman thing. Uh, so it's not like Michael or Helen ever fell to an obsession with madness. It's just that Gertrude damaged a fear entity. Uh, it's not clear what Gabriel the uh, sculpture is, and it's not like we get any perspective from him anyways, so... Uh, and then also, the man who wasn't there, that seems like that's a stranger episode. I don't care what the uh, creators say, that's very clearly a stranger episode. <laughs> oh, yeah. Which, the stranger and the spiral fade into each other, and I do think I have a pitch for what the spiral is. But, like, you could have... The spiral... and the, I mean, not the spiral. I do think I have a pitch for the stranger ask. is. I do think I have a pitch for the stranger. Uh, but you could easily have made the stranger and the spiral, like, one entity. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you have an idea for what the spiral's pitch is. What, what the avatars fall to. I'm totally blank on the spiral. I don't know why someone would want to be mad. Like... Yeah, uh, it's also, I don't think the spiral is especially well-defined. It has a really strong aesthetic and a really cool aesthetic. I love some of the spiral episodes, but it's really not extremely clear to me how thematically it's different from the stranger of not understanding something. Uh, like, you know, they, 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 like they, they say the entities bleed into each other, which is fine, but the spiral seems to exist entirely in... Like, a tiny gray area between uh, the the dark and the stranger. Like... Yeah. Uh, you know, if, if the entities are all colors, then the spiral is like a quaternary color. A single quaternary <laughs> color that sits between the spiral, or not the spiral, the stranger and the dark. And it just seems like... I think the idea that the entities could be subdivided that way is an interesting one. That should be possible, but also, like, you're getting way too specific at that point. Uh, 
so I guess we can go straight. I do like the idea that there, there could be, like, some entities that just, because they're so alien, they just don't take avatars because nobody can actually engage with them that way. Uh, but we're just going to say, like, what an avatar of the spiral would fall to. It's like, well, it doesn't seem like the spiral would... It doesn't make sense. Like, there's not a clear reason, and we don't have anybody to look for as a model in even the biggest sense. Uh, because the distortion is right. just like a damaged uh, monster. It's not an avatar. And the more I think about it, though, the more I think like some people do, in fact, sort of choose insanity. There might be something to that. It could be something like wanting to disengage from reality. Yeah, like basically wanting, you know, as the Joker put it, your own backstory to be multiple choice. Like, if there are no yeah, answers, like, if, if all answers are equally fictitious, then you can make up whichever one you like the best. But that also fades a lot into the dark, and it also right. fades a lot into the pitch I'm going to give for The Stranger. Which, let's... The Stranger is next, right? Yeah. So yeah, let's go ahead and get into that. Obviously, I think, like, The Stranger is... I don't want to be me. I want to be somebody else. I don't like who I am fundamentally. I wish I could pick and choose stuff about myself that I don't actually have the choice in picking. I like, and also it's like, uh, I could see it being about liking the anonymity of being able to switch from identity to identity as for whichever one is most useful for you at the time and not have to be a specific person. So if you do something wrong, you can switch to just being a new person entirely. If you, you get the eternal chance to start over whenever you need to and you can fit into any group you can be any person you need to be at any point and be not be them the moment you don't need to be them anymore. Uh, that is what I think the pitch of The Stranger is. We don't really get it, because it seems like The Stranger is another one of those that seems to only have... Like, we run into people who are, in theory, avatars, but it seems like more like they're just pieces of an identity that got devoured by The Stranger and spat out as something that's not anything related to it. Like, Nikola Orsonov does not seem... There doesn't seem any to be any continuity between Nikola Orsinov and Grimaldi the Clown. It just seems like parts of Grimaldi's body were used to make her. She doesn't seem to be him in any sense. Right. And it can make sense that if you become an avatar of the stranger with so much discontinu discontinuity between who you were and who you are, that you aren't that person anymore in any sense. But we don't actually see the sort of transition to that. Like, we see Grimaldi and we see Nicola. We don't see what's between. And, like, the, uh... The avatar... The other, like... We see, like, the... The stuff... The, uh, sawdust people. But it's, like, they're, like... They don't seem to have any continuity between the skins they were made out of. Like, when you... Sarah is just, like... Well, I just have a couple of Sarah's memories and her skin. She's not meaningfully Sarah. Yeah. Uh... And that's why I think, like, the best example of a stranger avatar is, and who wasn't there, we see that sort of becoming a different person, even though it's not like he wants to, but we do see that sort of process of becoming a different person, which I think feels much more stranger than Spiral. Absolutely. I, I would not have guessed Spiral for that in a million years. Well, okay, it probably would have been, like, my second or third guess, but, uh... <laughs> Like, you know, I cannot imagine what circumstances I would have said that was a Spiral episode and not a Stranger episode. Like, I'm actually surprised to hear you saying that, and maybe we had this conversation before, but, like, when you said that the man who wasn't there was a Spiral thing, I was like, wait, he was? Yep. <laughs> I don't know if you have any other insights on the Stranger. Not really. I like that one, and it feels like a compelling pitch. Um... And then, you know, the pitch for their version of reality is one where no one can know who you are, where, uh, you know, it is impossible for there to be continuity of identity, which it's basically, you know, the entire world is now 4chan, <laughs> which, like, there's a pitch to be made for that. There's also obvious drawbacks, so, which is good. Like, that's how you want it to be. You know, you want these, you want these entities both their end game and the process of becoming an avatar, you want them to be sort of terrible bargains. Where, uh... You know, there's enough being given up there that these entities are still broadly the bad guys, uh, just for imposing their vision of reality on the entire world and nothing else. 
but at the same time, there's enough of a pitch there that, you know, you can understand why someone would become an avatar of this entity and want to bring about this vision of the world. So, what's the next one? The Vast, which I think is pretty easy. Yeah, yeah, no, the Vast is all about roller coasters. <laughs> you follow the Vast because you just want increasing amounts of excitement. Like, you start out like you just, you do the roller coasters and then you do, uh, skydiving and deep sea diving and cave diving and like, you keep needing to escalate it and the vast allows you to escalate it like it gives you more and more excitement you get to you know it's like like i think like the guy who got eaten by the sky that early episode rather than him being a victim that should have been the start of a story of an avatar this guy who was really into this like dangerous activity this dangerous hobby but it's starting to get dull for him and then one day the sky eats him and he falls through a seemingly endless sky for hours and when he gets home He's not, like, freaked out. He's like, that's the best thing that ever happened to me, and I want to do A calculated risk. Uh, yeah. Because as it is, that was one of the episodes of, uh... One of the episodes that has this problem, um... That... Uh, there's a couple of episodes like this. The, the Lost John's Cave is another one like it, where... Yeah. Um, I find it really uncompelling when the, the horror is basically people who do dangerous things sometimes die. <laughs> like, you know, okay, so this guy got eaten by the sky, but he could have just as easily have died in a skydiving accident. Like, that happens sometimes. That's a risk he was taking. You know, spelunkers get lost and die sometimes. But, uh... But I think, like... Yeah. If it is instead like the beginning of a vast, because you know the the uh, the guy who is terrified of heights and ends up having to climb down an infinite ladder to escape a rooftop with no railings, like that's really scary because that guy didn't ask for that shit, you know. He had that thrust upon him and is now presumably trapped on a ladder, suffering from vertigo forever. Like that sucks. And you can see an avatar of the vast, like, you know, they scare people. Like, the justification is like, well, ultimately, I'm scaring people. Like, fear is good. Like, we talked about in last season, we talked about the whole fear is thing, excitement. Like, well, I'm just giving them a little jolt of excitement. I'm not ultimately hurting them. But, like, right. eventually they even get to the point where they are doing stuff where they're like, yeah, you didn't kill that person, but you did, like, they're never actually getting down from that ladder, are they? Like some point, like, they've fallen so far to the vast, it's like, yeah, you're not killing anyone, but effectively you are. Right. Uh, Which, uh, little... and it, it works out really well, too, because the vast and the buried are sort of opposites, in the way that a couple of these magnus entities pair up as opposites. Uh, you know, yeah. the vast is about huge open spaces, and the buried is about tight, enclosed spaces. Well... Uh, the Buried is about finally being able to rest, and the Vast is about constant thrills. Right? Like, someone who is uh, trapped in the Buried and doesn't want to be is saying, uh... Ah, God damn it. Okay. Move over there. There we are. But yeah, uh, so someone who is trapped in the buried, you know, is confined and wants to be able to uh, move around and, you know, is, is doesn't want to rest, wants to be able to move to experience the life. Someone who is trapped in the vast wants a fucking rest. <laughs> they are constantly exhausted and terrified by way too much excitement. This is, you know, this whole thing is way too intense for them. They want to turn it down a notch. I, they, they work very well as opposites. Yeah. You know, I am an avatar of the lonely, but, like, the v avatars of the vast, you feel like they're just, like, you know, having a good time. <laughs> vast is the last one, right? Uh, the web. The web. That's right. 
Um, I would say the pitch for the web is basically, you know, a combination of I'm the one in control here and I know something you don't know. I think I think there's two ways. There's either the desire, like the need to be in control, because like if I don't do it, it's not getting done right. So I need to be the one in control of everything. Uh, or alternatively, it's the exact opposite, and I need to not be in control. I want somebody else running the show. It could be I think either of those, and I don't think they have to be. I don't think like the web has to be just one. I think there could be some web avatars who fall because they want the control. And there are some web avatars who fall because they don't want the control. Because you get like, eh, because like it's not clear with the ones avatars we run into, like Annabelle Kane or Neil Legario, which way it is running. Like, so Neil you have both spiders and flies. Wanted, uh, Neil Legario seems to have wanted to lose control, but then Annabelle Kane, she is seems it, she seems to be in control, like in a very it's not clear. Like, I think it could be either way. <laughs> yeah, and I, they're both a pitch that I could see someone going for, which means that, like, they... Either you make separate entities for both of them, or you just say that you can follow to the web in two different ways. And I think, like, I don't immediately see what kind of alternative entity you could have for whichever one you exclude from the web, so probably just have give the web to both. Or give both to the web. Yeah, and ultimately right? the web is just about control. It doesn't necessarily need to be about right. which way it's going. Uh, and we're still in this dungeon, aren't we? We are. I mean, I do think we're getting close to the end of it, but like, holy shit. <laughs> 